Chuck Colson said, uh, many Christians have been infected with the most vir virul vir virulent virus of modern American life, what sociologist Robert Bell calls radical individualism. They concentrate on personal obedience to Christ as if all that matters is Jesus and me. But in doing so, they miss the point altogether. For Christianity is not a solitary belief system. Any genuine resurgence of Christianity, as history demonstrates, depends on a reawakening and renewal of that which is the essence of the faith. That is, the people of God, the new society, the body of Christ, which is made manifest in the world through the church. Today we start this new series. We're going to be looking at one another passages. Uh, there's scriptures all through the New Testament talking about one another, what we need to do for one another, how we need to treat one another, the way in which we're supposed to interact with one another. And, uh, and so we're going to be looking at that. Uh, sometimes, by the way, in, in different versions, it'll say each other rather than one another, but same, same thing, and we're going to be looking at that. And I think it's very important for us to look at these one another passages and be constantly reminded that if we have been called to walk this journey that we call life together. We've been called to walk this together. We, we, we use the Bible as our guide, but the Bible describes the church as a, as a body and as a family and as a, a living temple, as it were. And that's you and me. We, we're supposed to be walking together through this journey with the Lord. And many have bought into a misunderstanding when it comes to our faith. Uh, really kind of two misunderstandings. The first misunderstanding is that we can separate our faith from the rest of our life, as if, as if we have our faith life and then we have our regular life. But those two things are intrinsically connected. They're, you can't separate them. They're together. They're one. That's one misunderstanding that people have. The second misunderstanding some people have is that they think that our walk of faith is our personal walk of faith. And there is a truth to that. We personally have to take responsibility for the actions we take. But we're not in it alone. We're walking together. Our text for this morning is found in Romans chapter 12. And in Romans chapter 12, I want to read verses 3 through 5 here for you this morning. And listen to this one another passage. It says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with the body of Christ. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other or to one another. Paul starts off, or, or in this text, as we start off this series, I should say, Paul's telling us that we belong to each other. As a church, you belong to me. I belong to you. We're part of the same body he talks about. We're, we're part of the body of Christ, meaning we cannot function well without each other. If, if you're part of a body, you can't function well without the other parts doing their job too. If my right foot decides it's going to go that way and my left foot decides it's going to go that way, in a very short time, I'm going to be in a whole lot of trouble. That's the same thing in the church. Now, Paul tells us this in Romans, but to the Corinthians, he really jumps in and explains it. So let me jump over to there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 12, he gives us more information. He says, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free, but we have, been, we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit. We all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not the hand, 
that does not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear says, I'm, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. That's, that's the church. That's, that's what we need to grab hold of this morning. We, as the church, come as many parts, but we all make up together one body. That's what Paul desperately wants the early Christian to understand. And to be quite honest, that's what the world desperately needs to see in the church today. All the parts functioning together as one body. And by the way, one part is not more important than another part. All the parts function together. We don't need just a single part. We need every part. Every part. I heard this story. The Orthodox Church in Russia in 2008 were getting ready to open a church building that they had had to close for about a decade they were having some growth, and so they thought, well, let's, let's open back up this, this church building that's on the edge of Moscow. And so they went to open it up, and when they got there, there was no church building there. It was completely gone. They didn't know what had happened, so they started searching and trying to figure out what had happened. And they finally found out that nearby villagers had come into the town and had chiseled out brick by brick the bricks of this church because a businessman was giving them four cents for every brick. And so over a few years, the, the townsfolk had come and individually chiseled out brick after brick after brick of this building until there was no building left. It wasn't bulldozed down in one fell swoop. It was taken away one brick at a time. And I think that's so important for us to understand because that's the same way that some churches are destroyed, a brick by brick by brick. We as living stones, we as Christians who, who build up the body of, of, the, of the church, we, if I can mix metaphors, we, when we take ourselves out of service in the kingdom, we have removed a brick from the building. And, and as more and more of those people take themselves out of service to the kingdom, more and more bricks vanish until eventually, not with a fell swoop of a bulldozer, but by complacency, the church disappears from a community, one person at a time. By the way, the opposite is true as well. As people get more and more involved, the church continues to grow and be built up and strengthened as well. We live in a world that cannot afford for the church to disappear. We live in a church where we can't afford for you to disappear. So what does that mean? That means as we look at this text... That means the first thing we need to understand, and I've said this before, I'm saying it again because Scripture does. First thing we need to understand is we need you. We need you. You're not here just to fill a seat. You aren't here simply because you like how we do things. You aren't here so that you get a sticker in the attendance chart in heaven. God has placed you here because you are important to His body here in this community. That's why you're here. You're here because God wants you here because He wants you to function within the body that is here. The body of Christ depends on every single one of us, you and me included. In fact, you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a little farther down it says, this makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you belong, or excuse me, all of you together are Christ's body 
and each of you is a part of it. All of us together is Christ's body. That together is the key here. The church is a, it's not a one-person show. It's not a three-person show. It's not a 20-person show. The church is everyone coming to the table. It's a co-op of all people's gifts being used to serve in the kingdom. That's what the church is. That's what you and me are. Heard this story. Uh, it was written in a book, Outliers. Malcolm Gladwell tells of Christopher Lang Langan. Christopher Langan is a genius with a staggering IQ of 195. Now, in case you do not understand how high 195 IQ is, Einstein's IQ was 150. So this guy is way up there. Like, he is beyond up there. During high school, this guy could ace a foreign language test by just skimming the book two or three minutes before the test. He got a perfect SAT score, and he fell asleep in the middle of the exam. <laughs> I mean, this guy is at the top of the mental acuity. But Langan failed to use his exceptional gifts, and he ended up working on a horse farm in rural, rural Missouri. And according, according to Gladwell, the writer, he said Langan never had a community that helped him capitalize on his gifts. In fact, he summarizes Langan's story with this one sentence. He said Langan had to make his, own, his way all alone, no one with him. He said not rock stars, not professional athletes, not software billionaires, and not even geniuses ever make it alone. And that is so true. We were not designed to be alone. We were not designed to make it alone. We were designed to do it together. Now, you might be the smartest person in this room. I don't know who that is. I do know this. If you come up on the stage, you'll be the smartest person on the stage. But regardless, you'll never succeed like you want, and more importantly, like God wants, if you try to do it alone. We've been called into a body, and we need each other. And the first thing you need to understand is the church needs you. Now, the second thing we need to understand, according to Romans 12 and according to 1 Corinthians 12, is that we are different, but we're equal. We're different, but we're equal, but we're equal. Now, this is a hard concept for us to grab hold of, especially in our society. We are taught in our society to always try to elevate ourselves. We kind of have the UFC fighter mentality. You know, you go and it's before you got the weigh in and they're trying to intimidate the other guy and they're saying things like, I'm the greatest. And, you know, boxers did that back in the day and wrestlers still do that with their mask or whatever they got on. I don't know. Nacho Libre is my only wrestler that I know of. But, <laughs> but, call, but, but Paul says, recognize that all these parts of the body are extremely important. They're, they're all equally important to the function of the body. In Romans 12, 3, let's read that again because it's so important that we realize this. It says, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better then you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. Paul's warning us. He says, listen, listen, be careful, because you can easily elevate yourself. You can easily think you're more important than you really are. Everyone in the body is extremely important. Paul essentially is saying, just live up faithfully to God's call in your life. Live faithfully to what God has asked you to do for him. Equal in the Lord's eyes. We are all valuable in the Lord's eyes. He looks at us and he sees his son in our lives. In February 2006, an autistic high school senior named Jason McElwin, I hope I said his name right, 
He uh, taught his entire school a, a powerful lesson. Uh, he, he had served as the basketball team manager for three seasons. He would fetch all the water for the players. He'd catch the rebounds when they were shooting and warming up. He'd mop up the sweat off the floor. On the last game of the season, in his senior year, Jason's coach decided to reward this young man's great efforts by allowing him to suit up and play. The team was ahead by 20 points. There was four minutes to go. The coach put Jason in the game. Jason went in, and they passed him the ball, and he badly missed his first shot, and then he missed the second shot. Wasn't looking too good. But on the third shot, swish, a three-pointer. The entire, uh, everyone in the gymnasium erupted with applause as the ball went through the net. But Jason wasn't done yet. He went on to hit a total of six three-pointers, and he now holds... At least as of that day, he holds the Greece-Athena high school record for three-pointers. And he finished the game with 20 points in four minutes. Every single basket he hit, the crowd got more and more and more enthusiastic. By the time he hit his last shot, everyone was jumping up and down in a frenzy of excitement and happiness and disbelief. And soon the game ended, and they all rushed the court. His teammates hoisted him up on their shoulders and carried him around, celebrating what he had done. And after the game, his mother said, this is the first moment Jason has ever succeeded and could be proud of himself. I look at autism as a Berlin wall, and he cracked it. And he cracked it. What I find interesting is how everyone else celebrated what he had done. They celebrated his success. They celebrated this young man who hadn't got to play a single game until that day. I wonder how often we look down on someone questioning, what what can they possibly bring to the table? I wonder how often we, 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 we look at someone and we think, I wonder what God was thinking with them. I wonder how often we assume that that person, they, they, they surely cannot really make a difference, contribute. But, but God tells us through Paul's words here, you can't see what I see, God says. You can't see what I see. They're, they're going to inspire people, more people than you can imagine. They're, they're going to love people in ways that you could, never could. They're, they're going to contact people and reach people and share the good news with people that you would never have the opportunity to contact. See, sometimes it's easy for us to look at someone and think, mm, I'm not sure they have much to contribute. And God says, what is wrong with you? No matter who they are, in my hands, they can contribute. In mighty ways, in powerful ways, in unbelievable ways, they can contribute. Number three is we're heading in the same direction. That's the third lesson we need to understand. And this is so important. Since we belong to each other as one body, we need to be heading in the same direction as one body. Ephesians 4 says this, Instead we speak, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Now listen to what it says about Jesus. It says, He who is the head of His body, the church, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. We are the body of Jesus, but Jesus is the head. We need to always remember that. We're the body, but Jesus is the head, which means that as the body, what direction should we be going in? Whichever direction the head directs us to go in. We we should be going in the direction of God's will, really, regardless of what anybody else thinks. doesn't matter. Because Jesus is the head, not you, not me, not anyone else. Jesus is the head. And problems always occur within the body when different parts decide to go different directions, when different groups have different goals, when different of us want glory rather than put glory on Christ. 
It always tears us apart when we aren't heading in the same direction. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Make every effort to keep yourself united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Make every effort. It's another way of saying, always do everything you can to stay united in your work of Jesus. Listen, we're in this together. We're working together. And we should be following the lead of our Lord and Savior. Years ago, the Atlantic Monthly told about some superstar tenors. Jose Carreras, I don't I probably say his name wrong, uh, Placido Domingo and Luciano Pavarotti. They were performing together. All three of these men were performing together in Los Angeles. And a reporter came up to him and he was trying to push this, um, this issue of competitiveness between these three men. All three known as a great tenor in their own right. Domenico said this. He says, you have to put all of your concentration into opening your heart to the music. You can't be rivals when you're together making music. You know what? I thought his answer was so great because that's exactly true in the church too. That's always true in the church. We, we, we're together making music. It's not about who can sing louder. It's not about who sings this part or that. It's that we're all singing on key for the Lord in the same direction with the same song so that He gets the praise, not us. Whenever we head off in different directions, it gets ugly. But whenever we head off in God's direction, it becomes beautiful. It's beautiful music to His ears and to the world around us. So we start this sermon series, and essentially we belong to each other. This idea that we're part of the body, this idea that you and I are in this together is foundational to everything else we're going to hear because it is foundational to our walk with the Lord. It is foundational for the salvation of the world around us that you and I work together as a body, loving others and sharing what God has done in our lives. Ephesians 1 says this, God has put all things under the authority of Christ, has made Him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is His body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with Himself. Jesus wants to fill us with Himself, but that only happens if we allow Him to be the head and we take our role as body, doing His will through His Spirit, which means I need you and you need me, which means you might be different, but we're both valuable, which means we all need to be on the same page as we try to serve the Lord in the same direction. There's this movie some of you have watched, some of you have never heard of it. It's called Spartacus. Spartacus. Anybody remember Spartacus? It came out before I was born, but I still remember it. <laughs> so if you watched it at the theater, you're old. <laughs> it's a classic movie. It retells the historical account of the Great Roman Slave Rebellion, which happened in 71 B.C. Spartacus was the, was the a highly trained gladiator who escaped and led other slaves in, uh, into freedom. And their, their rebellion grew and slave, thousands upon thousands of slaves joined them in their cause as they fought against the Romans. They had victories and they had defeat, but they fought together. Near the end of the movie, the massive Roman army under the command of Senator Crassus, I hope is how you say it. But anyway, he captures the rebels and although he doesn't know who Spartacus is or what he looks like, he suspects that Spartacus is alive amongst the prisoners that they've captured. And so in full Roman uniform, he gallops up to the mouth of the valley where all the prisoners are being held, and he shouts an offer to them. They can escape death by crucifixion if they turn Spartacus over to him. Spartacus in the movie looks at the ground for a moment, and then he nobly gets to his feet. 
He's getting ready to turn himself in, but before he can do so, his comrade to the left stands and yells out, I am Spartacus. Then his comrade to the right stands up and yells out, I am Spartacus. And as the real Spartacus looks at those around him starting to yell this out, all of them begin to yell out. All of those captured slaves begin to yell out, no, I am Spartacus. I am Spartacus until there is a chorus of a thousand united proclaiming, I am Spartacus. I think that movie, or at least that scene in the movie, speaks volumes about what the church should look like. We should stand together, united, proclaiming, I am the Lord's, and I will stand for Him and work together with everyone here for Him, even if that means I come to an end. Is that what you and I are doing? Are we standing together? And if we haven't been standing together like we should, the real question is, will we stand together? We pray with me. God, I thank you for all you bless us with. I thank you that we are not in this alone. I thank you that we have your help, your spirit in our lives, but we also have our brothers and sisters in Christ standing with us, standing for us, as we stand for you. Lord, that's what our world needs to see. They need to see a church that actually lives like the church, that actually represents you, that actually does what it's called to do, and that is actually following your will. And I pray, Lord, that's us. And I pray to, we will continue to do that in a greater and greater way as we continue to want to be look more and more like your son, more and more like you. Lord, we love you and thank you. Thank you for allowing us to be your children. Thank you for calling us into this body. Thank you for enabling us with your spirit. And thank you for leading us to the lost where we can love on them, care for them, and share with them the great joy, the great encouragement, the great hope that through Jesus they too and have purpose, not just now, but for an eternity in your presence. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.